Hey everyone, I'm Amanda with DevExpress and welcome to today's webinar, Pivot and Analyze Data in your ASP.NET MVC Razor websites, presented by DevExpress Technical Evangelist, Mahul Harry. For those of you who don't know us here at DevExpress, we engineer feature complete presentation controls, IDE productivity tools, business application frameworks, and reporting systems for Visual Studio, whether you're using WPF, Silverlight, ASP.NET, or WinForms. In today's webinar, Mahul will build an MVC website and show how using DevExpress MVC extensions will help you to analyze and present data easily. He'll also provide an overview of the Razor web syntax and will demonstrate using it together with MVC extensions to create stunning yet powerful ASP.NET MVC web experiences. And I will now hand things over to Mahul Harry. Thank you very much, Amanda, and thank you everyone for joining today. We're going to take a look at a new extension that we just introduced for ASP.NET MVC in our MVC extension suite called the Pivot Grid. The Pivot Grid is a unique control. Uh, so let's first take a look at it. Well, actually, you know, let's jump into the agenda for today. Uh, to start off, I'm going to give you a quick demo of the Pivot Grid to get an idea of what it is, what its advantages are. And then I'm going to quickly cover uh, what is a pivot table, what, what defines a pivot table, you know, what, what why is it useful? Then we're going to cover the Razor View Engine. Now I see uh, a lot of you, uh, well, at least about half of you on this uh, webinar, are actually using it today. And so uh, if you're not, I think you will find this uh, uh, useful because we're going to cover it quite qu quickly, but I, I believe Razor View Engine has a lot of advantages over the WebForms View Engine. Now granted, it's not the only one, but I find that it's it's very useful, so we're going to cover that today. And then I'm going to using Razor in ASP.NVC3. I'm going to create an MVC website using the DevExpress Pivot Grid extension to show you how easy it is to use, how powerful it enables your end users to slice and data mine for data without you having to program any of that. And uh, I'll also show you how to theme this control. So let's just dive in. First, let's take a look at our pivot grid. Now, uh, let me start off simply by showing you that it's very easy to get to DevExpress. Uh, if you want to see the DevExpress MVC extensions, you can go to devexpress.com slash MVC, and this will redirect you to the uh, page that shows all of the DevExpress MVC extensions. And I believe we probably have one of the most extensive set of ASP.NET MVC extensions out there. Everything from a grid view, charts, reporting, HTML editor, and now the pivot grid. So let's take a look at the pivot grid. Now there's several ways you can get to the pivot grid demo. You can just click on try product demos or you can click on demos up here. I tend to just go to mvc.devexpress.com and that takes me directly to the ASP.NET MVC online demos. And it has all of the extensions here. So I'm going to click on the new pivot grid demo, and I'll click sample reports. So the very first thing is, what we, what we see here is, it looks very much like a grid, but right away we can see that it's got some unique layouts to it. First of all, I can, unlike a grid, see that the data is laid out logically, hierarchically. So for example here, I can see that I have a year, and it's broken down by quarter of the year, and I have data summarization for me. And also, I see I have a grand summary total for the column as well as for the rows. And I have built-in support for callbacks. Now, what's interesting about this is a pivot grid allows us to answer very useful questions about data that we normally couldn't do. So while a grid view has its strengths for finding data and narrowing down on data, a pivot grid has its strengths in helping us answer some key questions about data. So for example, this report uh, allows us to dynamically figure out who are the, the uh, customers that bought certain products within a year. So here I can see that uh, Alice Mutton was bought. Now I can further refine this by just clicking on the column and saying, well, I don't want to see every customer. Let's say I'm just interested in uh, Antonio, Anna, and Alfred's, and see what they've bought over the years. And quickly, I have a way to see 
for those three customers the products they have bought by those years. Now, I can also, using the pivot grid, show what are the top two products by customer. So I see right away that the Alfreds, their top two products are the veggie spread and the raclat. I can't pronounce that very well, but we see that easily right away. I can, I can show that what the products are and how I might be able to better use this information to target those customers or just help them in maybe providing some discounts or something. Whatever that data is useful for in your business, your end users can quickly find that information out. Whether it's top two products, whether it's top customers, or if you just want a summary of the orders by customers. Now, today we're going to be building this exact demo. Now, the code for all this demo is online, but what I want to show you is using ASP.MVC3, how easy it is and how powerful the pivot grid is by simply setting up uh, using ASP.MVC3 and Razor. So, uh, let us first take a look at the definition of a pivot table. So you'll hear me, hear me say pivot grid, pivot grid. Now, I mentioned this because when I first started looking at a pivot grid, I always asked myself, well, what is the difference? I mean, we have a grid view. Well, what, what is so special about a pivot grid? Well, if you ever used Excel, then you'll be familiar with this concept. So let's first take a look. Generally, if you go to Google and type in pivot wiki, it'll, it'll bring you to the definition of a pivot table on Wikipedia. Uh, actually, let's be more specific and say pivot, ah, sorry, pivot table. And Wikipedia defines it as a data summarization tool found in data programs like spreadsheets and business intelligence software. Now, what's interesting is a pivot table essentially allows you to take a flat table, a flat set of data like this that has region, gender, style, and some data points like units, price, and cost, and allows you to pivot on them, meaning that it allows you to create what's called a cross-tab report. So you may be asking yourself, well, what is a cross-tab report? Well, let's take a look at a cross-tabulation first. So a cross-tabulation allows us to take a sample of data. So here's a sample that shows 12 data points of genders of male and female and whether they're right-handed or left-handed. But we can't easily take a look at this data and say, well, how many female are right-handed? Well, we have to scan through and count this ourselves. And this is really inefficient. What would be more useful is if we can take this and create a contingency table, which is the result of the table of actually doing that summarization for us. And if we did that, the cross tabulation would uh, create this contingency table that has a list of summary of how many males are left-handed or right-handed and the total number of males in the overall sample of 12 and how many are left-handed females or right-handed females, as well as how many are left-handed overall and right-handed overall. And this gives us a quick way of looking and getting this information. Now, business intelligence software as well as programs like Excel have made this quite easy because we can quickly select this. Now, what the ASP.NET MVC Pivot Grid has done is allow you to data bind your data and automatically do this for you. All you have to define is what is the data point, what are the columns, the rows, and where what you will be filtering by. Now I'll go into a little bit more about that in just a minute. So let's get to coding. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to explore the ASP.NET MVC Razor View Engine for you. Let's start with Visual Studio. Now, ASP.NET MVC Razor View Engine was introduced in ASP.NET MVC 3.0. So I'm going to select File, New Project. Now, before ASP.NET MVC 3.0, uh, Microsoft had used 
the Webforms View Engine. And they did this because it was easy, it was available, it already took care of all the rendering, rendering you had IntelliSense built in. And it, while it had nothing to do with the Webforms framework, it was just the parsing engine built right into Visual Studio that made it easy for them. However, as later versions of MVC came out and MVC got more popular, what they found was users started to create their own view engines. So beyond Razor and Webforms view engines, there are several other out there. There's NHAML, Spark. Um, you, can do, you can look them up on Google by just typing in ASP.NET view engines. So here, let's start on a new ASP.NET MVC3 website. I'm just going to select an empty one, but the first thing you'll notice is we have a choice of view engines to use as the default for this project. Now, you can select the ASPX, which is the uh, extension for the Razor View Engine, or Razor. So I'm going to select Razor. Click OK. Now let me just quickly cover what are the design goals when Microsoft uh, created this. Um, they wanted to make a view engine that was compact, expressive, and fluid, and it was easy to learn did not require a new language, uh, it had great IntelliSense, uh, should be able to be used in any, any text editor, and it had to be unit testable as most MVC uh, uh, portions are. So they achieved this with Razor View Engine because view en the Razor View Engine allows you to leverage what you already know. Now, I'm going to create a new folder in Views, and I'll call this Home since this is an empty application, and in there we'll create a new view. And here, I'm going to call this index. It will be a Razor View Engine, and I'll just click OK. Now, I'm also going to create another uh, view in here. Ah, let's give Visual Studio a minute to catch up here. Now, I'll right click, add, select view, and I'm going to call this index uh, old, let's just say. And now, I still have a choice of different view engines. Now, if you have installed any other view engines, they will show up in here as well. For now, let's select Webforms View Engine. Now, it's important, because I, this, is a, this was based on Razor View default, we cannot use this option. Now, I'll explain this option in just a minute. But because there is no site master that's based off the Webforms View Engine, I'm just going to create a full page and not a part, uh, uh, master detail page. So the very first thing is if you're using Webforms View Engine now, you'll, you'll know that its big thing is these angle brackets. Now, what we can do with that is say something like date time today is and put in. And right away, you can see I have IntelliSense, which is great. Now, dot to long date string. And then put in some other information. Now. What we see here is I have a string literal. I have code that will be parsed. And it's parsed, and it knows this because of this token. And we have an end token to define where the code stops, and then some more strings. So uh, because this is ASP.NET, we cannot directly go to this view. And because this is, a, this is an empty project, we need to add a controller. And I'll call this home because of the ASP.NET convention. Now index will simply go to the index. So let's create another one. Oops. I'm going to use a little code rush shortcut here to create a new action result. And this will be called index underscore old. And it's going to return simply the view with the same name. I'm not passing in any data. We're going to do that in just a little bit. But for now, when I hit this index index underscore old, it's going to know where to go. So now, let's take a quick look at this in action. So right away, it went to the index page. Now, if we uh, go to the home slash index old page, we'll see that we get the date time that we defined by the variable as well as 
our complete overall string that it built for us. Now let's see how this might look in Razor. Oops. So in Razor, we have the option of not having to use those angle brackets, and this is quite useful. So let's just say we want to produce something like this. Today's date is date time dot now dot too long date time string. Now, right away, you'll notice that the big difference is it's much easier to read. I don't have that odd looking angle brackets. So, right away, uh, we have this setup where basically this is exactly defined and the parser in Visual Studio knows this is the entire set of code so that we don't need any way to terminate this using an end token. Now this is really useful because this is what they meant by creating it you a fast and fluid. It just flows. We can see that our string mixes with the literal and we can keep typing without having to have an escape end clause. And our end result will be the exact same. So let's just take a look at a couple of other samples about a razor and then we'll dive into our pivot grid. Now, what's interesting about Razor is we can create some very useful things like having code if block. So if I can, I can say if one equals one, which we know it will. But what's interesting here is now I can put in a string. So I've just typed code, and without telling it where my code ends and where my string begins, it is smart enough to know this. So I can say yes, one always equals one and continue on and terminate it and it's smart enough to know this and this is what's great about Razor and then I can keep going and typing sorry about that folks I think we just having a little technical difficulties here all right so now uh, obviously, if one doesn't equal one, that would be very unusual. So, in the else statement, I'm just going to say that's unusual. Now, let's take a look at this in action. Now, as we would expect, we should get the date and our first statement. And what's great about it is my code and my uh, string literals do not have to worry about getting mixed. Now, I want to show one other thing, which is multi-line statements. So we can create a statement where it says uh, define uh, something like integer number equals one uh, and then maybe you can define another one called string and uh, call it message let's call it message equals number is and whatever our number is or the value of this number variable but that doesn't make sense to escape this twice what we can do is have a multi-line statement by simply putting our ampersand and closing it off. Now, I can reference that easily and say something like your message at message. And just like that, I can put in any number of code block lines in my message here. But we can make this even easier. For example, let's say rather than having a string literal here, we can actually incorporate that by using what's called a multi-token statement. So using the ampersand and parentheses, I can define the string right within here by saying number is, and then doing that evaluation by adding the number string. And what's fantastic is here, this is an integer. It automatically gets converted to a string for us. And this is what's great about Razor. Is it takes away a lot of that thinking for us. And it's much easier and fluid to write a statement like this rather than 
having to define separate variables and so forth. So let's take a look at this in action. And we get the same result. Now I want to mention one other thing about Razor, and that is uh, it has a new way of doing layouts. Now let's add another view here. Now I'm going to say it's going to derive by using a layout or master page. Now you'll notice that I have left this blank here, which is odd because typically we have to define what that master page that it's deriving off of is. And so here I'm going to simply call this uh, test So let's be sure to switch back to Razor View Engine here. So uh, what happens is if we leave it empty, Visual Studio tells us that if we left this empty, it's going to use the view, the, the layout that's defined in the view start file. So let's just click add here. And so we notice is in, inside of the view folders, we have this view start. This view start has one statement that says the layout will be derived from this layout uh, master page. And we go to this folder, Views Shared Layout, we can see that here is our master page that defines the scripts of jQuery, or Modernizer, our style sheet, and this is where uh, the default page, I'm sorry, the derived page will be rendered using this at render body. So I just wanted to make a little clear because sometimes it's not always, uh, it's kind of hard to understand, well, what does the view start for and where does it come from? All right. So that's Razor View Engine. What I recommend is if you're in really interested in this, uh, Scott 3 has a great blog post uh, that you can see if you go to his website here. If you just look up Scott Gu introducing Razor, you'll see. And you'll see that I have mentioned uh, he has links to Spark and Hamel. There's a lot of other view engines out there, but you know, he goes through all of the different things you can do with Razor View Engine, and there are quite a bit. I find that the things that I demonstrated there today are, tend to be about the 90% case, at least for me. So now let's get into the DevExpress Perfect Grade. We're going to start a new project. Now, when you install the DevExpress ASP.NVC extensions, you'll find that under the web tab, whether it's Visual Basic or Visual C Sharp, we've provided project templates to help you get started. And there are three of them. So there's the MVC2 web application in case you still are using MVC2. And there's two for MVC3. There is the ASPX version, which is the WebForms View Engine version, and the Razor View Engine version. So we're going to use the Razor View Engine version, and I'll call this MVC Pivot 2. And yes, let's close the previous application. Now, what this does is it creates a nearly empty project, ASP.NVC project. Now, we didn't want to create a completely empty version and have a version that was uh, a light version. So what we did was we compromised because we didn't want to pollute the, uh, the project template that you see there. And because we already had three there, we didn't want to confuse our customers by giving five different options and so forth. Because it's very easy to simply remove any views out of this that you don't want. But we have the standard ones like you would find in Visual Studio or an empty home controller, an empty view. But what's great about this is it has all of the references that you would need to use DevExpress and the extensions as well as all of the style sheets as well as script files that are necessary to use DevExpress and these extensions. Now we're going to be looking at this in, in a little bit later when I theme this and, and I'll come back to it. So. Let's first start with uh, the index page. Now, what the first thing I like to do when I first get started with any project, any new project template, is make sure it works right. So let's just take a quick look at this in, the, in uh, our Chrome browser. And we can see that it's rendered just fine. I succeeded, built it, and ran it. But uh, I want to make a note here that when you come up on this error, what happened is because I tried to go directly to the view. Now, if I remove this, and simply go to the default, it's going to automatically know using MVC routing 
to go to that index page. So there's a way to get around this. Let's close this. And, uh, and uh, there's a simple way to get around this. What I do is I right click on this project, go to properties, and under web, select a specific start page, and I leave it empty. Now, let's just save this, close it, and the next time, whatever view in, you're in, it's always going to go to that first URL and not to any specific URL. Now, I'm not going to make use of any of the view bag information, so let's remove this, and let's remove the view bag itself. So now I have a pretty much an empty page, and I can get started by adding this. Now, I want to mention that most of the DevExpress MVC extensions support callbacks. So, uh, callbacks, meaning that if I switch a pager, you'll see this little animation comes up, and it's a partial page refresh. Now, MVC by default doesn't support partial page refresh callbacks like that. So, what we do to enable this is if you're using one of the DevExpress Express MVC extensions that requires callbacks, then put it inside a partial page, and it's very easy to do. So what I'm first going to do is I'm going to right-click on Home here, I'm going to click Add, and I'm going to add a new view here, and I'm going to call this Pivot Grid Partial. Now I'm going to select OK, and here we just have a simple Pivot Grid Partial page here. Uh, actually, you know what, let's do that again. I forgot a key step there. When you create this pivot grid partial page, be sure to select this checkbox that says create as partial view. Now this is very important so that it knows that this is not going to render all of the HTML header tags and footer tags, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what's great is now, we can say that, you know, um, the grid here. And in the index page, we can simply reference it. So using the HTML helper class, I can call it partial method, which, as it says, renders a speci specified partial view as HTML encoded string. So I can easily say partial and pass it the name of the pivot grid partial page. Now if I just did this, it would render the partial page. So for now, let's just leave it as that. And uh, I'll leave this alone. We're not going to define the, the view just yet because the very first thing we usually need to do in any project is bring in some data. So I'm going to right click on app data here and select add. I'm going to add an existing item which basically copies over the information. Now, when you first install DevExpress uh, projects, uh, in fact, let me just be clear about this demo. This demo, including all of the other demos that include the code online as well as the, the database files that we use for it, all of that is included as one Visual Studio project, which you can open up locally when you install our installation and play with it. You can see exactly how it works. Now, you can find this by going to your project public documents folder. So if you go to your C drive under users, public, public documents, you'll find a DevExpress demos folder. If you go in there, you under components, ASP.NET, MVC, C Sharp, there are the WebForms View Engine demos and the Razor View Engine demos. So I'll go under Razor, I'll go App Data, and I'm going to copy the data file that we use which is the Northwind SQL Express file, Northwind MDF, and the log file that belongs to it. And when I select Add, it's going to copy those locally to this project. So let's double click on this and take a look at what's inside there. Now while that's loading, I should mention that uh, all of the demos that we provide, whether whichever platform it is, are included locally with our installation. So under the tables here, we can see there are several tables, including some summary tables already created for us, like current product list, category sales. What I want to do is I want to add only those tables like categories, employees, customers, and I'm going to build a link query 
for myself that gets only that customer information for reports that we were looking for. So what we're going to do is under models, I'm going to add a new item. Now, our extensions, DevExpress MVC extensions, support any type of object binding that is supported by MVC. So whether it's linked to SQL or Entity Framework, we fully support that. So for this demo, I'm going to just go to data, keep it simple, and just use link to SQL. And I'll call this North Wind. And what this will do is it's going to create a new uh, link to SQL file and open up the designer. Now I can click on Server Explorer. And this, I want to make sure that this is my local endwind.mdb file. So I'll go back to the solution here, collapse references, and double click on this. And I will bring in only those uh, tables that I find will be useful for us. So we'll go employees, customers, order details, extended, subtotals, products, region, shippers, suppliers. I believe that should be enough. So let's just drag these and drop them onto the designer here. And Visual Studio will create the representation. Now, an important step is whenever you pull in any type of uh, any type of ORM that's using uh, information that you'll be using within that design environment, what you first thing you want to do is compile it. So I'm going to build this, and it succeeded. And this is important because what happens is if we go back to Solution Explorer, is Visual Studio has created this layout and this designer. This designer shows us that it's created this data context for us as well as the tables for uh, those, ta uh, those objects for the tables that are represented in the back end. So here's our all object relational file. And if we want to reference it, we want to make sure that Visual Studio is compiled so we can reference it in our project. So now we have our data set up. We have a model. Now, it's not good convention to reference this model directly. So I, I don't really want to say, hey, new data context, et cetera, et cetera here in my controller. What we're going to do is inside of a uh, model here, I'm going to add another class. And this is going to be my data provider. So I'll call this Northwind Data Provider. Now what's great about this is you can see that we actually use this in our samples as well. So what, what I want to do with this data provider is uh, make sure that the data context is created. So a quick explanation of linked to SQL is if you want to get at any of this information, the first thing you have to do is create this class, which is the data context. Make sure a version of this exists. And then under this class are all the tables so we can access them. So rather than doing that every time the controller for every method, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this data provider that makes it much easier to simply call this. And I'm going to make the entire, um, I'm going to make the calls static so I don't need to actually create them either. This data provider is going to act pretty much like a singleton, which means that one instance of it will always exist whenever I need to call it. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to create a, a, a constant string. And I'll call this Northwind data context key. Now we need to give it a name. What this key does is allows us to make sure that only one instance of the data context is going to be existing. And we're going to track that using the HTTP context object of ASP.NET. So I'll start by creating a public static property. And this is the North and it's of type Northwind Data Context. As I mentioned, we need one of these to access anything in our link to SQL. And I'll simply call this DB. So the first thing I'm going to do is, actually the only thing I'm going to do to this is to define a get property. So as I mentioned, we're going to be using the HTTP context object and under its current property, it has an items collection. And in the items collection, we're going to use that string, the Northwind data context collection. 
And we're going to say that if this is, oops, if this is null, then we're going to define it. And what it basically is, is going to hold is that data context. So we'll say Northwind data context. And now we can return this data key context. But I want to make sure it's actually of the type because right now, since this is a collection, even though it holds that data context that we just created, I want to make sure I properly typecast it as that collection. So Northwind data context. Now, that's it. Let's close this and close that. So, taking a quick look at this, what this does is when I reference this property, it's a static method that says, okay, well, get me this property. Well, first thing I want to see is, does this thing exist? If it doesn't, create it. But if it does, just return that data context. So, I'm always using one data context. Now, we're going to create one other method, and this is the uh, this is the method that I'm going to use to get the customer reports. Now, most DevExpress and MVC extensions, uh, like most MVC extensions for dealing with data display, require that you pass it an I enumerable. So this is the same for us as well. Now you'll notice that. Whenever you get this little underscore and squiggly, it's telling you, hey, I, I have no idea what this thing is. So what I can do is I can simply hit control space. Now, Coderish also makes this pretty easy as well. For now, I'll just use the built-in Visual Studio one. But this now allows me to uh, simply add this using statement that says, yes, I enumerable belongs to system.collections. So this method will be called get customer reports. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to return from customer in db dot. Now, because it knows that db is part of the Northern data context, I can access any of those tables. So here you can see I've got customers, I've got categories, I've got everything that I really want. But what I what I really want to do, I'm going to get items from the customers table, but I'm going to select a link to SQL statement that's a little bit more complex and explain it. So uh, I'll try not to do too, little, too much of cut and paste, but I believe this for the sake of time might be a little easier. So what's happening here is we are getting information from several tables, the main one being customers. But I'm using information from customers as well as orders, order details, products to get four fields that I really care about, which is the product name, company name, the order date, and the product amount. And you can see the product amount itself is uh, calculating from uh, the unit price, the quantity, as well as making sure it gives me uh, uh, the right value type, meaning that it's, the decimal place number is not going to be off. It's going to represent the proper hundreds of thousands of characters. So. Because both of these methods are static, I can easily call db.getCustomerReports now, and it will take care of the work of creating this data context as well as executing this. Now, as I mentioned, we could have thrown this in our controller, but it just doesn't make sense because ASP.MVC is all about being clean. So we're going to respect that. And now what we can do is here, now I can, I can put in here something like db. But well, the first thing is it doesn't know what I'm talking about because we're not referencing the model. So what we want to do is say using MVC pivot to dot models. And now I can say, oops, db dot, I'm sorry, not db, the name of our class, Northwind data provider dot. And you can see we can access the property or the actual method, which takes care of both for us. So. What I want to do is rather than creating a model to hold that, I'm just going to pass it into the view. Now, what's great about MVC is we can pass it any number of things. I can pass it a string, I can pass it the object model as well, or I can pass it just a string or just the object model. Because MVC works by convention, I really, since my view is the name named it the same as my action method, I don't really need to 
send in a view again unless I was going to just display a different view here. So rather than doing, well, you know what, for this, let's just do this index, comma, Northwind data, get customer reports. So now what I'm doing here is saying, hey, display this view and pass it this model. Now, what's great is we can go back to our indexes and we now have a model that's being passed to us. So let's make sure we are properly uh, referencing that model. So the first thing is, uh, let's just make sure we define that and say model is I enumerable. Now, once again, it wants us to make sure that we've got the right type in there. Now, we know that our controller is passing, in, passing us an I enumerable type model. So now that we have this model, we can pass it on to, oops, let's make sure we use the proper convention here, the proper uh, partial page. So the index page will simply render it. Now we can put in some string here that says, uh, let's say h2 dev express asp.net mvc pivot grid. Now, finally, we have all the pieces in place. We've got a model, it's being passed through our index. The only thing left for us is to define our pivot grid partial page. Now, as I mentioned, our MVC extensions are very easy to use. To define them, we're simply going to call the, the HTML helpful method that you commonly find, because we've overwritten it as well. And here, if you type in HTML that Dev Express, you'll see that this is the extension factory to access any of the Dev Express extensions. So now if I put in HTML Dev Express dot, these are all the MVC extensions available to you. So I'll put in pivot grid and it's very easy to define. So the first thing I'm going to do is define the settings for this. Now, the first property we typically define for any extension is the name. And the name is important. For this one, I'm just going to call it pivot grid. But let's say if I was using the Dev Express text box and I was strongly binding that to our model, it would be important what this name is because as I mentioned, MVC is all about convention. So if this was the name field, I want to make sure I called it the proper, or I'm sorry, not name, customer name or something, that I make sure I called it customer name. Now, pivot grid is enough. Now, the second most important property is the callback route values. What this does, and let's let me highlight this is, is allows you to define what the callback routing logic is, and what controller and action will be used. Meaning that when you, I'm sorry, or your end users click something that requires a callback. How does it know where to go? How does it know what to draw? Well, that's what the callback route, route values allows us to do. So what we're going to do is define the new callback route value, which simply takes two, uh, simply needs two parameters. And that is, what controller is it going to? In our case, it's going to be home. And what action method is it going to call? So, oops. So in our case, we don't actually have an action method defined yet. So what I'm going to do is we're going to call it pivot grid partial, the same name as our view to make things a little bit simpler. Now, we're going to have to make sure we go back and define this in our home controller because when I click on a method that does a callback, it's going to go to the controller and look for this action method that we defined in the view. So for now, let's keep going and define. We're going to say settings dot with now I can define a width by saying unit is, uh, uh, in fact, let's do that. Let's define a 100% width. So unit dot, actually let's know what unit is. So let's make sure it says, yeah, system web UI web controls unit dot percentage and we can see this is set to 100. Now, I'm going to further define this by saying 
we're going to set what's called option view. Now you can see the pivot grid has a lot of options you can define for it. chart data, so it's customization data, all that view. Now I'll, I'll dig into some of those in just a little bit. Not it, not necessarily the options, but what some of the thing, other things the uh, pivot grid can do, and use, and it'll make a little bit more sense. So under the options view, we can define uh, things like horizontal scroll bar, the display mode, etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say show horizontal scroll bar is equal to true so that if our data is wider than what's displayed on the browser a scroll bar a scroll bar a scroll bar will appear excuse me it's hard to get scroll bar out but and allow the end users to scroll left and right to see all the columns and it's dynamic so if we collapse any of the fields they'll disappear as well I'm sorry the scroll bar will disappear as well okay so now we've defined the base items. Now we actually need to define the fields, and we can do that do that by simply going settings that fields dot add, and I'm going to say field is equal to field dot area, and I'll explain area in just a second. So uh, for this, as you can see, there are four areas: column, data, filter, and row. The best way to explain this is that columns, uh, column areas, I'm sorry, column fields will go in this area here. Row fields will go in this area. And row fields values are used in the rows. Column values are used in the columns. Data is what, this is the data area, and anything placed in the data area is used for the summary. And the filter, finally, is used to filter the data up here. So that's pretty much long and short of the explanation. And we, don't, we can define actually everything in the, in the filter area and then let the user uh, figure out where they want to move the fields. I believe it's better to actually set up the columns for them initially. So I'm going to set the filter area. And then I'm going to set the area index. And the area index is simply the order in which it will appear. So if we put two things in the filter area, which one comes first and which one comes second? Then we're going to define the field name. Now this is the, the, the actual name of the field in the model. And in this case, in this case, this is the company name. And then we're going to define the caption. And this simply says is rather than say company name, I want to call this field customer. And that's it. So now I'm going to use my handy dandy cut and paste routine and define a few more fields. So the second field I want to define is the order date. So the first thing is the order date is not going to be in this area. It's going to be in the column area. And the field it binds to is the order date. And I'm, I'm not actually going to use the whole order date. I'm going to use just a year portion of the order date. And to define that, I'm going to say field dot group interval. Now this is a great way because the pivot grid is automatically going to allow us to take only a portion of the date. And you can see we have a lot of options, whether it's day of the week, the quarter, the year, the month. So we're going to take the date year portion. Now. Now, we want to do the same thing and define one for uh, quarter. So it's still going to bind to that, and the caption will say quarter. And I want to make sure the pivot uh, interval says date quarter, and I want to further define a couple of items, which is use what's called the value format. And this defines What what val how, the the format of the value that it gets used for evaluation purposes? So I want to first set the format type. I'm going to set it to numeric. And we're also going to set the format string. And this will be. We'll set it to a string where it says quarter. And 
the actual value will be right there. So whether it's quarter one or quarter two, three, four, it will really be showed that way. And finally, let me define the product amount fields. and the product name fields. And for the sake of time, I will simply paste these in. Uh, let's see this. But you can see that this, I should, let me change this. Remember I mentioned area index defines the order. Since these are both in the column area, I want to show the date first, and then I want to show the quarter. And then the product amount will go into the data area and the only thing I've done for it is set its cell format type to custom. Because it is a amount value, I'm going to use the format string as currency. And finally, I've just added the product name field to the uh, filter area. So actually, yes. OK, so now let's close this up. And we can call the bind method and pass it the model, the inumerable mo model. And then we'll call the get HTML call, which actually renders the pivot grid partial. Now, let's compile this. Now, if we run this, in fact, let's run this. Um, there is a key piece that I mentioned earlier that we do still need to define. Now, while that's loading, uh, what I'll mention is that um, as you can see, right away, our pivot grid works. Now, I want to, before I show you uh, this excellent pivot grid, I want to show you that if I click this, what happened is it gives me an error. It says a public action method called pivot grid partial was not found. And that's because I said, hey, if you try to do a callback, go look for that method. And we actually didn't define that method. So let's go back to our home controller and make sure we define this action method. Now, now I'm going to use a little code with shortcut here to define a new public action method. It will be called pivot grid partial. And rather than returning the whole view as we are here, we're, since this is a partial method, we're only going to return a partial view. So I want to make sure I call the right method here. And inside, as I mentioned, we could pass it the name. But really, we only need to pass it the Northwind Data Provider and get customer reports method. And that's it. So even inside here, I can remove index. Or if you'd like, you can leave it. Or if my method was not called pivot grid partial or it was called pivot grid partial 2, then I'd want to pass it the name. But because this is MVC and it works by convention, it's automatically going to look for this. So let's save this and run this again. Now, we're just about done here. And I just want to show a couple of features here. And the first thing is that Let's say I didn't want to look at all of the years. Instead of having to scroll left and right, let me just take a look. I don't want to see all the quarters. I can right click up here and say collapse all. And right away, what I get is only the years. And then I can further say, well, I only want to see 1996. And in it are only the third and fourth quarters. Now, I can further customize this and say, well, let's say I want to see the customers and the products that belong to the customers. It's easy for your end users to data mine this information because they completely control how they want to answer the question and what data they want to get at. And automatically, these items are summarized for them as well as shown. So now I can also right click up here, show a few lists. If I wanted to take out any fields that I don't want evaluated in here, so as you can see, now I'm only using the year and not the quarter. So we can actually add extra fields that are not being used in here. So, and the other thing is everything here works by drag and drop. So as you can see, let me pause this here. These two arrows will indicate for your end users where this item will be placed, whether it's before or after. Now, 
This helps us answer some very common uh, questions like, who are our top customers? So let's say we only want to look at the customers and we want to evaluate. And so I can easily click sort here. I can right click on product here and say sort by the customer column. And we can get a quick view of our best customers and we can see quick stop is that. Now, if I further wanted to uh, see only the top customers, what I can do is add one more option in here that further refines this by saying, hey, for the field, take only the top value count that's equal to 10. That means give me only the top 10 customers. And now, when I refresh this grid, it will show me only the top 10 customers so that And as we can see, we can get the same result, but we don't have all the other customers because we only care about the top 10 here. Now, uh, I want to I pause. We're reaching the one-hour limit here, so let me just quickly wrap up here. Is So we let's quickly recap. We, we built a excellent ASP.NET MVC website using the DevExpress Pivot Grid, using uh, a, a, a very powerful extension that lets your end users slice data, data mine, and really answer some key questions that a normal grid view just couldn't easily answer. Now, grid views have their advantages, but as you can see, the pivot grid, when you want to analyze data or slice and dice data, can really take it to another level. And we took a look at the Razor View Engine, which was actually uh, very fast and fluid. And for me, it's, it's my personal favorite for MVC websites, and I highly recommend you try it out. It's very easy to use and uh, very easy to get used to. So uh, the DevExpress MVC extensions includes everything from a grid view. We have a reporting suite, charts, pivot grid, HTML editor tree view, data editors, and more. As I mentioned, if you go to devexpress.com slash MVC, you can take a look at these. And all of the MVC extensions support uh, things like themes, touch support for iPad and Android tablets, they're cross-browser compliant, meaning they work on everything from Safari on the Mac to Firefox on Linux, and we test this with every release. It has a rich uh, client-side support as well as jQuery, their accessibility section 508 compliant. Um, so I highly recommend you check them out, and especially go to the demos here and take a look at all the different things. As I said, you can take a look at the code for any of these, as well as they all come with these beautiful themes. So you can style them using these very nice looking professional Office 2010 themes or Office 23. There's even some wild ones called Youthful and Red Wine that give it a splash of red or green if your user prefer that. In fact, you can expose this entire look to your end users. Now, I'll wrap this up by simply saying that, you know, the pivot grid is very powerful. You, you've got the option to even display a chart that is automatically rendered based on the data in the pivot grid for your end users. So as they change the data around, you can easily uh, allow them to see what kind of data it is. And you can change the chart as well. So I can change it from a line to an area chart. And we have tons of charts available, as you can see. There's support for exporting. So you can export to any number of formats like PDF, Excel, HTML, text, as well as OLAP support. So if you have SQL Server Analysis Services, you can bind the pivot grid to an OLAP queue. And if there's a lot of interest in looking at the OLAP version of this, please uh, let me know and we'll do a future webinar to show you how to do OLAP with charts integration and so forth. And uh, finally, I'd like to mention that you can get a free trial today. All, all the DevExpress MV extensions fully uh, functional with support from our support team at devexpress.com. Just go to devexpress.com and you'll find the link to download it. And after you download it and install it, you will see this demo center. Click on any one of the platforms, obviously ASP is the one that will have all our ASP stuff, and you can try any of those demos that I showed you locally. 
thank you very much. You, my name is Mule Harry. You can reach me at mharry at devexpress.com. Uh, you can also go to devexpress.com. And I'm going to throw a uh, shameless plug one last time for my blog. If you go to devexpress.com slash mehool, you'll find my blog. Please check it out. Uh, if you don't have time to subscribe to it via RSS, what I recommend is there's a link on the site here that you can get updates via email. So if you scroll down on the right side here and click subscribe to my blog via email, you can also get updates from FeedBurner. Just put in your email and this little CAPTCHA and you should get uh, updates whenever I post about, let's say, this webinar or an interesting case study with a customer and so forth. So with that, I am done. Thank you very much and please let us know if you have any questions. Hey, Mahul, thank you for that. Um, while we get your questions in, uh, we do have one more poll question for you all, um, and here it is. Uh, what platform are you considering moving to in the next six months, or what, what platform are you evaluating? Um, none, HTML5, WPF, or Silverlight are your options. So we'll wait just a sec to get those votes in. <clears throat> it looks like, wow, we'll worry about 70% HTML5 considering moving to. Interesting, and then about 17% Silverlight and 13% are sticking with what they currently use. Let me awesome. let me address yeah. one thing about HTML5. I, I should I should have probably put this in the bullet point, but all DevExpress ASP.NET products are HTML5 compliant, meaning that. Um, and let me just give a quick overview of HTML5 because there seems to be some confusion about what it is, and you know, is it a new rendering? First of all, HTML5 introduces new HTML tags and a new doc type at the very top. So that doesn't mean that you have to completely change around what is uh, what is used there. So let's take a quick look here. Um, so this is HTML5. When you see, I'm sorry, not that. Uh, when you see this doc type, that means this is HTML5. Now, as you can see, all DevExpress MVC extensions support it. And HTML5 is really HTML5 plus XHTML plus you know, any of the previous tags that it still supports. Now, generally what is meant by HTML5 today is leveraging those new tags. So rather than using uh, H1s, you might use nav or you know, any of the specific tags they've made for some of the intentions of what it is those tags are supposed to represent. So, as we go further, DevExpress is going to keep leveraging. But the great thing is, let's say if you're using HTML, is your website is HTML5 uh, now today, you can use any of the DevExpress HTML products. Um, awesome. No. Sure. Hey, Mahul, we do have some questions that have popped in. Um, the first one is, is it easy to connect the pivot grid to the MVC chart control in a master detail fashion? Mm, yes, it is. So let me bring this up. Mm, now, when when one of the hardest things about our demos is these demos require a lot of work to create because we obviously have to test all the themes across all the browsers and you know write all the good things like documentation and so forth. Uh, functionality is the first thing we test, of course. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to show you is we have drill down support now. Do not, I, I think, you know, sometimes we think of a pivot grid like a master detail, but here you can see in this whole app, this type of master detail is automatic, right? Meaning that it's automatically calculated for you. You're not going to set the detail source. The way the pivot grid works is it works a set of flat data, and then it figures out, ah, okay, so if I put the category here, I'm going to find the relationship between the products and the category. And then I'm going to connect that up so that it gives me a master and detail uh, setup like that. So the answer is yes. Let me bring up charts integration here. Uh, the answer is yes. And if you look at the code here, you can see exactly how we set up the charts. And as I mentioned, you can open this project up locally and play with it yourself. Uh, and if there's a lot of interest in it, I you know please let you know email me. And I will, uh, you know, Amanda and I will set up a future webinar to show you how to integrate a chart uh, into this. 
But the short answer is yes. And to uh, let me just bring this up, demos .com. And to show you that there's also another feature that we don't have in the MVC demo, but we do have in the, uh, have in the regular pivot grid demo. But it is possible in MVC is the ability to do uh, drill down. So if I uh, right, if I click on one of these items here, I can further drill down and have a little pop up that shows me ah okay there's this information. So yeah, you can mimic this as well, and I can have a chart down here as well that is hooked up to this. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, great. There's one more question. Uh, are older browsers also supported by the Pivot Grid? Any missing features? Older browsers, as in IE6, yes. So if we take a look, in fact, let's go back and go to introduction here. Uh, let's do this, ASP. If you scroll down here, you're going to see all of the different things. So we have, you know, lightweight SEO-friendly rendering, client-side functionality, uh, themes, Ajax, and here you get a list of all the browsers we support. We support everything from Firefox 2.0, Google Chrome, Apple Safari 3, Opera 9, and even IE6. And even Microsoft wants you to move away from IE6, and you know we still support it. So, uh, absolutely, I, I, you know, I mean, if you go back to let's say Netscape Navigator, of course, you know, we're not going to be supporting old old versions, but we can support up to some of the newer versions. But yeah, all the popular browsers are supported. In fact, uh, a lot of browsers like the new Microsoft IE 10 and Windows 8, uh, you know, when it first came out, generally we don't support betas because betas tend to change and so forth. But I did some quick testing on it and I found that most of our ASP.NET products still render just fine on it because we've done a lot of good work to make sure that when you've got this cross-browser compatibility, you're using the most uh, common HTML that is uh, going to work. And you know, without having to do a bunch of hacks and so forth. So, and we're also very reticent of that. There, are, there are times when we won't implement a feature if it requires some, you know, unusual hacks. So you can rest assured that you know, our themes, our, our rendering is all going to work properly across all the different platforms as well as browsers. And then um, we have one more question, and it's about: Can we get the demos for download? Yes. If you're on the demo site, click this free trial button here, and it'll take you to a page where you just put in your email, you get a link to download, download it, install it, and then, uh, you know, if you, if you like, watch this video again, or, you know, what I highly recommend also is we have a TV channel, tv.devexpress.com. If you go here, uh, type in MVC in the search, and you'll see all the different videos we have available for MVC that help you get started. So that's another great thing about DevExpress is there's a ton of training material, all free, all available online. If you run into any issues, the first thing I always recommend is go to our version of Google, which is search.devexpress.com, and just type in whatever problem you, you run into, and you'll generally find an answer for it. And the reason I recommend this is because it's the fastest way to get an answer. Rather than contacting support or looking up in the forums, if you click this, this will give you access to support and forums because generally the, the problem you ran into has probably been asked and answered before. But do not be afraid if you come into an issue to contact our support and just go to support, ask a question, and create a little support ticket uh, make sure you're logged in, and then, like I said, for the first 30 days, uh, I'm sorry, you, the for the full 30 days of the trial, you have access to our f support team, and it's all free, which is uh, quite unheard of in most companies because you get charged for support. So, highly recommend you try them because a lot of people really love our support team because they go above and beyond to help our customers. Awesome, great. Well, that is all the questions. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. Since, thank you very much. And since we're at um, a little bit over our time, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. So thank you so much, Mahul. Um, it was a really excellent webinar. 
All right, everybody, so we are constantly updating our website with new webinars, so remember to check out devexpress.com slash webinars for upcoming sessions. Learn how to accelerate productivity, build stunning apps, and work faster and smarter than ever before with DX2. And again, if you haven't tried DX2 yet, download and try it for free today. We want to say thanks so much to Code Project for hosting, and of course, thank you all for joining us. Let's see what develops.